Hello, everybody. How are you doing? I hope well. Let's look at my documents. So this is scheduled for, as I look at my calendar, uh, 31 of October, which is Halloween day. So be careful in the night when you go have these parties. What you're going to go do, be very careful. Okay, so again, this is scheduled for uh, Monday, the 31st of October. And again, the usual creative writing, which will be books for children and young adults this week. And then uh, poetry will be the sound of poetry. So hopefully you enjoy these kinds of things. Okay, all right. Well, let me proceed with the usual. Going to the material. This thing got in the way here. All right, start the slideshow. Oh, let me minimize myself. Thank you. Skip the step there. Go from the beginning. Okay. ENG 102. Curated writing is the official title for the class. So as I stated, we're getting into chapter five, books for children and young adults, okay? Do you still remember your favorite books from childhood? Do you still read fairy tales? Do your teenage kids inspire you to write? So don't worry about that, Temujin or Phil or Mr. Hong, I know you don't have teenage kids. Then maybe you should explore writing for children and adults. Now we're going to get into a category of book called Easy Readers. Once children start to read, they're eager or excited for books that are similar to those read by grown-ups, not the picture books they read when they were little, you know, one dog or one ball. Easy Readers are meant to suit the transition from pre-reader Little, little monster, tiny Todd cannot read to a reader and to give growing kids a sense of pride in their new abilities. You have a little factoid on the bottom. Sometimes I read these, sometimes I don't. Uh, if they're not pertinent, I won't, but this is pertinent, which means important. The standard for easy readers is 64 pages, but some have fewer. An average word count is 1,500, but again, some go well below that number. And like in the picture books, the illustrations are very important. That's for your easy readers. You have to see a lot of photos to connect because they have a minimum vocabulary. Do we go on? All right. Though newly sophisticated, uh, to a degree, depending on your level of sophistication. Beginning readers still enjoy stories that revolve around animals and insects, fairy tales, everyday situations, adventures, and family. With a bit more room, easy readers, uh, often contain a slightly more complex story, but it is still it still must be easy to understand and appropriate for the age group. You don't want to have a science fiction novel for these kids that won't get anywhere. All right. To make children's reading experiences successful, easy readers tell their stories in short, uncomplicated sentences. That is the key. Don't forget that. That doesn't mean they can't include interesting words or what they mean high level words, but not too high. Or words that are a bit of a stretch, which means hard to believe. That's what a stretch means, however. Uh, these books are no longer the sea spot, sea spot run texts of the past. 
they can be a great way for youngsters to build their vocabulary and uh, have fun with words. What does it what it does mean is that writers must keep an eye on the number of words they string together so that new readers don't struggle or get frustrated. You don't want to start out, let's say, with very easy words. And then you start doing words that are more too complicated. You don't want to do that. Like picture books, easy readers need to capture kids' attention from the start, from the very beginning, move right through the action, and end on a satisfying or happy note. You're not going to find these readers, you know, being big on sad or depressing stories. Kids don't want to hear that. Okay, now we get into a very famous author, probably the most famous for kids, writing for kids for the last 50 years. The Captivating Dr. Seuss, if you've ever read his book, Green Eggs and Ham, I had to read that as a kid. Though Seuss Geisel, otherwise known as Dr. Seuss, was a writer, extraordinaire, which means superb, of children's early readers, Geisel was born in Springfield, Massachusetts in 1904. After graduating from college, he headed to Oxford University in England to seek a doctorate in literature and then returned to the United States to work for a leading humor magazine called Judge. Never heard of it, but it's way before my time. Maybe even my father's time. Uh, Geisel submitted Humorous articles and cartoons to Judd, which means he sent them, as well as cartoons to Life, which was a big magazine, and I think they stopped publishing it when I was in my early 20s, so five years ago. Vanity Fair, which I still think is around. Liberty, I don't think around anymore. On a shipboard trip to Europe in the 30s, yes, even before my father. The rhythm of the ship's engine became the inspiration for his and to think that I saw it on Mulberry Street, which he submitted it and it was rejected 43 times before a friend finally published the book. Uh, it reminds me of uh, KFC, which originally was Kentucky Fried Chicken and it was run by what my Korean stu uh, Korean students call KFC Haraboji, right? Colonel Sanders himself. And a lot of people don't know his story. They think he was a young guy and had a great chicken recipe and uh, was famous for most of his life. I don't think anybody bought his chicken recipe until he was 60 years old and lived in his car traveling. He lived in the South. So different cities and states in the South trying to a financial backer to have a restaurant with his exciting recipe. So that man suffered for a long time. So again, it was rejected 43 times, similar to the many rejections to Colonel Sanders. Geisel then went on to produce an Oscar-winning documentary and an Oscar-winning cartoon. After reading a report that detailed or showed in uh, line illiteracy, illiteracy means that you cannot read among school children and discovering the fact that many children had trouble learning to read because why? It's a big, interesting reason. Their books were boring, probably too hard also. Geisel's publisher sent him a list of 250 words that he thought were important for first graders to know. They used to, like when uh, students would uh, enroll in the ESL classes I taught, uh, these books were very, very uh, popular. I would say that 
500 English words that you must know or the 1,000 English words that you need to succeed, you know, or 1,500. I don't know if they still make those kinds of books. So anyway, he asked Geisel to use them in a book, which he did. The much-loved Cat in the Hat, which contains 220 of the words. Now, you see, I just enjoyed Cat in the Hat as a kid, but I didn't know that it was st st strategically set up where the publisher said, we, we got to get them. I'm giving you these 220 words, and I'll write a kid story around it, so they're essential. It's very interesting. Makes... Uh, Geisel's work harder. Several years later, Geisel accepted a challenge from a fellow author to write a book that used only 50 words. Wow, and harder. The result was the classic Green Eggs and Ham, which is what I told you earlier, Green Eggs and Ham. Sam, I am, and the Green Eggs and Ham. That's what I am. Something like that. Heavy on rhyming. The beloved Dr. Seuss eventually wrote and illustrated scores, which means many books that teach children well with rhyme, said, rhythm, and fun. So I guess not boring. His books were definitely anything but boring. That's for sure. Now we're going to get into another category. Don't be confused. Say, well, what chapter is this? You know, chapter what? No, there's early readers, which we just talked about. And then probably the most famous of those is a author is a Dr. Seuss. And then now we have chapter books. So I have to explain what are chapter books and how are they different than uh, early readers. Once kids are more comfortable reading, they're ready for the chapter books. It's a style of book. Here, the story is divided into sections or chapters, like an adult book, and the plot is more developed. Chapter books can run to 80 pages and are usually presented in 10 to 12 short chapters. Don't forget that. It's short. We're still not doing long chapters. Generally, the chapters are brief enough so that a youngster can complete one in a sitting Okay, I'll read this e note too. In chapter books, subject matter again runs the gamut, which means it's a large variety. But children in elementary school are ready to tackle or study more emotional and dramatic topics. Relationships between friends, animals, or people in difficult situations. Family upsets uh, means problems. Humorous exploits, exploits means adventures, are all fodder, which means are all, you know, like wood to fire for books that children will want to spend time with. So they're getting more broad and more mature in their tastes, like again, away from little doggies and uh, balls and candies and things like that. Characters, too, are more developed and three-dimensional in chapter books. A favorite character-driven book of many grade school kids and to study as an excellent example of the type is Sarah, Lane, and Tall by Patricia McLaughlin. This Newbery Award-winning short story focuses on Sarah, a woman from Maine who crosses the country in the late 19th century to become the wife of a Midwestern farmer and mother to his two children. As the newly created family gets to know one another, each member confronts the sorrows or sadness of loss, loss of family and friends, death, and the joys and invincibility of love. So you see how they counter that. They Now they're trusting that these little older kids can I don't want to say get into, but learn about the sadness of loss. But see, they balance it. Like I said, you still have to end these things on a happy note. It's not just, okay, your uncle died, or your brother died, and accept it, and it's painful, and shut up. No. 
talks about, well, they can overcome this with the invincibility of love, the family love, and what have you. But again, much more mature than the previous early readers. Here's another example. In Beverly Clearly's Dear Mr. Henshaw, another Newbery Award winner that gets it heart, its heart from the main character, an unhappy second grader named Lee finds that corresponding with an author and then with himself helps him through difficult times that many young children can relate to. A second Clary book, Ramona, age eight, follows Ramona, a boisterous, that's a high level way of saying noisy and jumpy child, but charmingly annoying girl, as she takes her first school bus ride deals with a bully, wrangles with her sister Beezus, wrangles is kind of like, you know, play fighting, and runs full tilt through another family childhood situations. Um, other chapters, books to study include The Bears on Hemlock Mountain by Alice Daglish and The Girl with 500 Middle Names by Margaret Peterson Haddix. I hope that's not true. That's a bit too many to have 500 middle names. Continuing. One big difference between early readers and chapter books is that illustrations are no longer as critical. So those money, money photos, in the early readers, you're not gonna see so many of them as you progress into chapter books. It says more, while many chapter books still contain beautiful drawings, like I said, still contain some, and paintings that enrich and enliven or make your reading comes to life, the pages, grade schoolers no longer need the extensive text reinforcement that pictures provide. So again, when you're really a small yo-yo, uh, you need a lot of photos because sometimes you're like la la lu li li li. Well, I don't what's the la or the lu. Then you see the picture and it makes a lot of sense. Money pictures, right? And later, as your vocabulary gets stronger and you understand, it's like okay, one or two pictures is cool. That's enough. Once children are are reading fairly easily, story and its actions become their focus, right? The the thing of the reading itself in opening their imagination. That's the important uh, transition that's uh, hopefully happening at that point. If that one particular student, that's not happening for them, then they're gonna say, well, I have pictures, I think I need more pictures. But it's usually not the case, you know? Okay. Now we get into books for the middle grades. Kind of a tricky area there. When children reach the upper elementary grades and junior high, they often enjoy books that revolve or center around more grown up concerns or adult. Though adventure, mysteries and animals are still appealing topics, Many children in this age group also enjoy delving or getting into books that take them to other worlds, including works with historical themes and science fiction saga. See, now we're getting into the science fiction where kids, uh, I think back in the day, kids went crazy for Star Wars in middle grades, right? See, there's science fiction. Around this time, there's often a growing interest in nonfiction fare or stories. So you want to know true stories and biographies about people, right? Some get into the science fiction and other ones say, hey, I, what is the real life about people? I'm a young guy. And then you read and find out somebody has cancer and they defeat it. Uh, they go through a bad divorce, whatever. And these things sound scary, but interesting. So fact-filled books that provide wide-ranging, which is a big variety, compelling, compelling makes you want to read it, information in a readable, non-preachy style 
that comes from the word to preach or preachers in the uh, church, the old church, they used to just talk to you. You really didn't have a conversation. They talked to you. So you don't want to read a book that, that it just tells you, hey, kid, shut up and listen. No, they very readable and very listenable as if that was a real word. And these are high on many kids' lists. Colorful illustrations still do, ex still dot the text, which means there's even less now, but they're still there. And kids enjoy getting in an occasional look at their favorite characters and story setting. So again, you can look at that kind of like, you know, how they do uh, science fiction movies. You see just little bits of the creature until the end, right? But they're correlating this here saying that uh, the less and less illustrations and photos, the more the student concentrates on the readings and gets more enjoyment out of it. And just occasionally has to be reminded of something with a beautiful drawing or photo. Okay, again, a factoid. While, while there's no standard length for middle grade books, like we talked about readers and uh, chapter, they often run from 96 to 128 pages. A good number of popular works like the Harry Potter series. Now you know the Harry Potter is also for middle uh, grade. Are much longer from 200 to 500 pages or more. One book that middle grade children have been happily curling up with in the bed, I guess, with a blanket for sometimes is C.S. Lewis's The Lion, The Witch, The Wardrobe. Fantasy, animal characters, and adventure converge or come together in this classic's pages. Middle graders are transported to the land beyond the wardrobe, where magical happenings take place. Other perennial favorites means, you know, every year perennial, that offer up otherworldly doings are Madeleine Laangles, beautifully crafted, A Wrinkle in Time, and Norton Juster's Captivating, The Phantom Tollbooth, which we don't have totals anymore, unfortunately. Okay, another little factoid. Judy Bloom has written for just about every age group, from picture and storybooks to middle grade. Young adult and adult, more than 800 million copies of her books have been sold, and her writing awards take up multiple pages. In one of her most popular books, otherwise known as Sheila the Great, Bloom transposed her own fears from childhood. She was afraid of dogs, the dark, and thunderstorms onto the main character. So in other words, she wrote that the main character had these fears, right? So she tried to work them out through her literature. Like the teenagers, they will soon become Many middle graders like to read about kids with experiences much like their own, right? What are other kids going through that are my age, right? Very interesting to them at that time. The ups and downs of leaving childhood are a prominent focus for many books aimed at this audience, including issues that relate to school, and teachers, family and home life, independence, feelings, and change. A lot of these things, when they talk about the ups and downs of leaving childhood, um, they tend to focus on kids losing their innocence, right? And having to deal, as they say, with the old, cruel world. So, like for example, they grew up as kids and their mother has always loved them. And you know, would do anything for them. And then let's say they find their first love and the girl falls in love with the young boy. But, you know, because she's so young, in a short time she's bored and doesn't like him anymore. So the kid now is faced, the boy is now faced with a girl that will break his heart. That's never happened to him. He knew his mother. 
would never do that, you know? So there's that, or bully issues, or things that you can get or can't get. As a kid, your mom and dad gave you everything, and then you learn, uh-oh, you don't have enough money to buy something, or people are being unfair. You learn about the world. Younger children in this category still enjoy the familiarity of stories that feature animals. Though the animals may be experiencing very human and very unsettling emotions. Older kids appreciate fast-paced stories filled with action and adventure that speak to the rush to become part of a more grown-up world so these young boys can drive a car, a sports car, and speed and, I don't know, become a policeman or a soldier and get involved with action. Now we move on to young adult books. When kids reach the end of junior high and enter those never a dull moment teenage years, the fiction that often interests them is very similar in nature to the cross section of novels that is available to adults. So the same, we're starting to have the same kind of taste as adults because they're young adults now. Themes that deal with romance, uh-oh, did I speak romance? But not explicit sex, right? Values, fantasy, friendship, trying to get that best girlfriend or best friend, buddy. And family surface often or often pop up. And stories can contain complicated situations and evoke or bring forth very strong feelings. High school interests, including sports, drama, various clubs and hobbies, the outdoors, dances, history, technology, and travel. And friends, friends, friends are often incorporated in the plot. And of course, the protagonists are always teenagers. Yeah, they want to know about themselves. So I guess that's why it, it, this even comes forward in movies. You always have these, they call them coming of age movies. So we have like the Mighty Ducks hockey movies. We had the Stand By Me movie, the serious movie with a bunch of kids that I think had to deal with a dead body and other things and they started to be young adults. Many of those young actors became adult actors. And, uh, you know, various comedy baseball movies and things where kids are playing Little League and uh, grow up together. So a little factoid, because the maturity levels of teens can range wide, widely. So what they're saying there is that, let's say you have a 16-year-old and one has experience a number of things and is more mature and one at 16 still has not experienced a lot of things maybe they never had to deal with a bully uh, never had a girl that broke their heart never were treated unfairly in something where they had to realize that that could happen so that's why it says the maturity level of teens can range quite widely uh, there are still many books that touch only slightly on difficult issues. Many teen novels concentrate more on wacky, which means crazy, if you've never heard of wacky. And what gen are you wacky? Behavior and humor. Yeah, so they're like crazy kid stuff, kids, you know, boys trying beer for the first time or, you know, skateboarding off the street into the river. Just wacky behavior. You know, Joan Bowers, Hope Was Here, is a good example of the kind of books that appeal, appeal to, which teenagers like them, and are read by teenagers. The story chronicles 16-year-old Hope, who helps her aunt Addie, the woman 
who raised her when her mother ran off to run a diner for a man with leukemia. The plot is filled with situations and issues that are important to many teens as they move uncertainly toward adulthood. Romance between Hope, okay, like I said, that first romance, and another diner worker, and between Addie, her aunt, and the restaurant owner, concern about friends and loved ones, self-image and self-awareness, change, the future, happiness, and plenty of food since they're at a diner. In Monster, this is another book by Walter Dean Myers, 16-year-old Steve Harmon faces charges of being the lookout for a man who shot a convenience store owner. So lookout is like the kind of person that sits in the car and looks for the police and says, we gotta go. Did he do it or was he just at the wrong place at the wrong time? The unusual recounting or retelling of the story incorporates movie script format, journal writing and text as readers learn about Steve's life before the murder and how he feels as the trial goes on. The compelling look at a troubled time in the teen-oriented language, so they keep the language down to a teen level, make this novel many older teens want to read because they're excited reading about kids and they're speaking the way that they speak at school. So this factoid, when writing for teens, it is particularly helpful for authors to think back to their own high school years. The intensity, growth, and frequent absurdity, or absurdity is another word for ridiculousness, of the time can be hard for adults to recapture. But spending time around teens can bring those memories back. So again, what they're saying there is that as you get older and mature, you get married, you have your own kids, you're working your nine to five, you're thinking about doing your 30 years and retiring. It's hard for you to remember how maybe you were in high school and the silly things that you did, you threw water balloons at people, um, you know, you try to make fun of your teacher, maybe you stole some candy or something and uh or toilet paper somebody's house so it's hard for you to remember those days or that because you would never do things like that now at your present age as a father and a husband businessman right but if you hang around teens teens as you read they can bring these memories back on the lighter side a year down yonder richard peck's 2001 newberry award winner Chronicles the story of 15-year-old Mary Alice as she spends a year living with her very quirky grandmother. Quirky, I think they started using quirky like 30 years ago. So quirky is, boy, there's a, a, a wide definition on quirky, but usually people are quirky. Um, they, what are considered what people would consider to have some very strange habits or idiosyncrasies. That's a high level word for you, sorry. But it means like habits and people say, why does that person do that strange thing or this strange thing? So if you do enough strange things, people might call you quirky, so be careful. Uh, the kids at her new school think she's a rich girl. She's forced to live in a hick town, which means a country town away from the city after growing up in Chicago. And her grandmother keeps committing one outrageous act after another. A lively, engaging story is filled with incidents and emotions that today's teens can relate to, even though this teen novel 
believe it or not, is set or written about 1937. Crazy stuff. You know, I, I'm trying to give you an idea, like something quirky. Okay. All right. Uh, traditionally, like, um, and you guys have probably had it too, I, I, I'm guessing, right? Uh, like, Americans will have mashed potatoes, like your mom makes mashed potatoes. You know, and then she makes some kind of vegetable, like uh, peas, green peas corn let's say corn right now adults maybe pick up the peas in their spoon and eat them kids will throw the peas on top of the uh or corn on top of the uh mashed potatoes and eat them together but a quirky person believe like if they give you a serving of peas let's say there's 50 peas there they're so small right a quirky person will eat one pea at a time. It's one of the strangest things you'll ever see. Or I saw a guy eat a hamburger with a knife and fork. Okay, that's kind of quirky. All right. So those are two examples of quirky. Ah, so we finished the creative writing part of our lesson today. Now we're going to move off into poetry and hopefully you will like the issue of the sound of poetry. You know what I mean. I hope so as I look at my notes here. Okay. All right. Oh, all right. The sound of poetry is different from that of a short story, essay, or novel. Let me read this again. There's a secret why. The sound of poetry is different from that of a short story, essay, or novel. You might be able to guess out why I did that twice later. Prose forms can be poised and polished. Poise is kind of like ready to go. And polish means they're 100% finished. Uh, but they do not sustain the musical quality that poetry does. Poetry is derived or taken from a time before writing was used. Interesting. A time when religious rites, family histories, and stories were spoken, sung, or chanted. La, 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 chanting. As you write, keep in mind the history of verse and pay close attention to the sounds of the language you use in your attempt to write poetry. Consonants. Since languages generally begin in spoken rather than written form, the smallest units of English are its sounds. The English language divides sounds into two well-known categories. And it's like, with cheese or without cheese? No. Uh, the two well-known categories, consonants and vowels. But we know about that. With these categories, there are hard and soft consonants and short and long vowels. So there are about four times as many consonants as vowels in the English alphabet. So hard consonants. Uh, the consonant sounds are divided according to the way you use your lips tongue, nasal passages inside your nose, and vocal cords. For example, there is one pair of consonants whose sounds are created by stopping the air at your lips. Say the letters B and P to yourself. Notice how you close your lips to start each sound. Notice also that you voice the B and keep the P silent. These are both hard sounds because of the small burst of air and the sound you release when you open your mouth again. When writing poetry, you want to keep in mind the sounds of the letters and words you use. For example, 
if you are trying to describe the slow, relaxed movement of a woman, you may choose the word saunter over the word walk. It's more descriptive. Saunter begins and ends with soft consonants and has a smoother sound and more description than walk, which ends with a hard K sound. Walk, that's the hard K. Now say the letters D and T. Notice this time that you stop the air by pressing the tip of your tongue against the ridge behind your upper teeth. You should also notice that you voice the D and keep the T silent. Like B and P, these sounds are hard because of the burst of air and the sound that comes when you pull your tongue away again. Now I'll say the letters G, hard G, and K. With these two sounds, you stop the air by pressing the back of your tongue against the back of your mouth. The G sound is voiced, and the K sound is voiceless. Again, the hard sound is produced by the burst of air that occurs when the breathing passage is opened again. Now we get into soft consonants. Now try saying the letters V and F to yourself. You should immediately notice three differences between these two letters and the six that you sounded out earlier. First of all, you do not completely stop the air as it passes through your mouth when saving these two letters. Secondly, you can maintain the sound of the V or the F for several seconds, but you can't do this with B, P, D, or T, hard sounds, G or K included. Finally, the sounds of the V and the F are softer. You do not produce a burst of sound in air, but rather a steady stream. For these reasons, V and F are considered soft consonants. There are several other pairs of voiced and voiceless soft consonants, but there are also a few single voice soft consonants. One of the latter is L, heard at the beginning of words like licorice, laughter, and love. What is love? Tall, what is love? I have a sandwich and explain it to you. The R sound appears in words such as rug, real, and royal. The W sound made by blowing the airstream through puckered lips. You pucker your lips like when you're going to kiss. And this appears in window and windy. <coughs> the Y sound, yellow, yes, is made by pushing the middle of the tongue towards the roof of the mouth. Okay, uh, if you're going to notice, I'm not going to get into vowels because, again, it doesn't explain anything really for poetry in this book. It's going to rehash the stuff that you already learned when you first learned English. So I don't want to bore you with that. I want to stay on the subject and get back to heavily emphasis on poetry definition. Okay, rhyme part one. Probably the one sound tool that is most closely associated with poetry is rhyme. For, remember that. Okay. If two lines end with words having the same terminal sound, you might automatically assume that you have found a song, nursery rhyme, jingle, or a poem. Say, so what's a jingle? Jingle are those things that they write for commercials on t TV. Like they used to have one for Burger King. At Burger King, they had this little, it's like a little song, have it your way, have it your way at Burger King. And in and out had one in and out that's what a hamburger is all about that's it short and sweet right uh, that's a jingle rhyme creates a melody or rhythm that may correspond well with the subject matter you choose for a particular poem the essential feature of a rhyme is two or more words and then in the same vowel consonant sound, combination, regardless of spelling. For example, the words bored, which means I'm bored, I can't take it anymore, not interesting. And then bored, which is a piece of wood, and toward rhyme, they all rhyme. These words father and bother also rhyme, father, father. 
Certain types of poems can be identified by the pattern of rhymed words they contain. But before you learn to identify poems by their rhymes, you need to identify the different types of rhymes themselves. Places to rhyme, this is important. Hint, hint. The most common place to put rhyming words in poetry is at the ends of lines, kind of like the end of your sentence. This kind of rhyme is called end rhyme. Here is an example of some end rhyming taken from Sonnet 73 by William Shakespeare. The time of year thou mayest in me behold, when yellow leaves or none or few do hang upon those boughs which shake against the cold, bare ruined choirs where late the sweet birds sang. Okay, so as it explains here, the words that rhyme were behold and cold, so behold and it skipped, went to cold, and then hang, skip, and sang placed at the end of alternating lines, right? At the end. Note, however, that although Shakespeare ends each line with a rhyming word, he does not end a sentence with each line. He weaves, which, you know, like you get your car and you drive around in a figure eight, you weave through traffic. He weaves all four lines into a single sentence. You're like, no, no, no. Yeah, look, you do not, get a punctuation mark until the end. That's where the period is. So that is one sentence. Maybe not grammatically correct, but we're doing poetry, folks. So again, he weaves all four lines into a single sentence. If the poem is read as though it has no line breaks, the rhymes almost vanish among the other words. So if you read where well, there was no breaks, then that sound of the rhymes would dis disappear or as they say, sis up here. Another form of rhyme is called internal rhyme. With this technique, the rhyming words can be tucked away anywhere within a line or in, a cons or in consecutive lines. Sometimes a word with a line can rhyme with a word at the end of the line. And of that, an example of such internal rhyme appears in the second stanza of Samuel Taylor Coleridge's Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Okay. The bridegroom's doors are open wide, and I am next of kin. The guests are met, the feast is set, mayest hear the merry din. So you're saying, what? Okay, so here we go. The internal rhyme appears in the third line with the words met, set. The guests are met. The feast is set. Rhyme, 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 rhyme. Here, no. Here, also, no. And then here, maybe with these two as it skipped the line, right? Note also that Coleridge uses the end rhymes, kin and din, see? End rhymes, which we had page before. The strong rhyme pattern, reinforced by the phrases that end when the lines end, gives the poem a song like la, 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 la quality, okay? Now, alliteration. Oh, how exciting. Have you done your alliteration today? I have. Oh, it's very exciting. Another nice pattern to use in poetry. Forget that pattern, not to, oh no, okay, let me see here, got to use a special technique, I got jacked up last week, here we go, thank God, okay, oh, I just did it again, not at all, what's going on, what are my previous, there we go, I'm hitting the keyboard, it's too close, okay, Another nice pattern, so like I said, look at pattern, is to use poetry is alliteration. If you delighted or enjoyed in tongue twisters, which is, uh, you know your tongue twisters, right? How, how many 
Woodchucks could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? That's a tongue twister. When you were younger, such as she sells seashells by the seashore, right? You will recognize this pattern immediately. Alliteration is the repetition of sounds, usually consonants, and at the beginning of words. As with rhyme, you can vary the pattern of alliteration by embedding or fixing in there the repeated sounds within words. This embedding is known as consonants. You can also repeat vowel sounds initially and internally. The repetition of vowel sounds is called assonant. For example, consider the phrase big bad Bob. I think I knew this guy. He was big and he was bad and his name was Bob. This phrase displays simple alliteration. Now, add a few words to this phrase to make it a full sentence. Bumps abound aboard the barge. Big, bad, don't tell me it's gonna be Bob. Bob, yes. The words, the added words, bumps and barge, added to the existing alliteration, but in the words abound and aboard, the B sound is embedded or stuck in there within the words. However, the B sound in both words appears at the front of the stressed syllables, so the repetition still strikes your ears, or you still hear the rhyming or the tongue twister. Also, the two words abound and aboard repeat the initial A sound, the mid central vowel. Don't worry about that. So these words show assonance as well. Okay. In the English language, alliteration actually has an older presence than rhyme in poetry. Wow. So alliteration is older than rhyme when used in poetry. Alliterative verse based on patterns of alliteration and stressed syllables dates back to old English times and was the basis of poems such as Beowulf and Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Is he green because he ate pickles? I, I don't know. I'm not sure. Now we'll get into oral poetry. It's clear that plays are written for the purpose of performance, but what about poems? Are poems just to be read by yourself quietly in a corner? As muskrats and bull weevils eat your morning oatmeal? You may intend some of your poetry to be read silently, but other poems are meant to be heard. Poetry, in general, is a performance art. So same thing. It employs so many tools of sound that it often won't reach its potential until it is read for an audience. I did not know that. You learn something new each day. The value of reading aloud. The ancients committed to memory such works as Beowulf, which means they read it so many times they could remember all the words in their mind by memory, and the Epic of Gilgamesh, passing them down from generation to generation. Today, poets continue to display the beauty of the spoken word, the beauty. But whether or not you want to read your books to an audience, you must be brave enough to read them aloud to yourself. You must listen to your own words. So not only you sitting in a corner reading silently, but you must read it aloud so you can hear it, you know, feel for it, it's rhythm. Primarily reading your work aloud is a method of editing. So remember that's a method of editing that will allow you to find the poem's natural pauses and cadences. So you won't really do that until you read it. The shoe came down the stairs. Now I sound like Captain Kirk, but until you read it aloud, you're not gonna hear that if you just read it silently. The manner in which you pronounce a word or pause at a punctuation mark may assist you in determining the poem's line breaks. Secondly, the more you read the poem aloud, 
the more you will absorb poems, nuances. So the nuances are the slight, I mean, people have nuances, right? So it's the slight feelings and showings that the poem brings forth, the words bring forth as you read them. And these sounds may spark ideas or develop. And what do you know? We're done with the creative writing and uh, poetry reading for this week. And we move on to the questions. Yes, sir. Questions. So breaking it up, five creative writing questions and five poetry questions. S'il vous plaît, mon ami. Number one in the creative writing category to make children's reading experiences successful, how should writers tell their stories? Interesting. Hopefully you were paying attention. Two, Dr. Seuss read a report that said children had trouble learning because, uh, another way of saying, why? What was the problem, right? Let me know what the problem was. Three, what is one big difference between early readers and chapter books? That's why I stressed earlier that there are different categories, right? Or explain what these differences are. Or what do many middle graders like to read? What kind of reading? Five, the fiction that often interests young adults is similar in nature to what, or dare I say, whom? Hint, hint. Okay. All right now, the poetry questions. What is different from short story, essay, or novel? I made this really easy in the beginning, so I don't want to get an email. I can't find this. What are you talking about? Okay. Seven. What are the two consonants? Again, is it with cheese or without cheese? Eight, where is the most common place to put rhyming words? Oh, in the trunk of my car. That's where I put all the rhyming words because I, I don't want to deal with them. No, I think not. Nine, what is another nice pattern to use in poetry? Student's going to say up and down, uh, left to right, diagonal, circle. No. And then... Last poetry question for this week. Primarily reading your work aloud is what kind of method? Okay, that is also there. Don't be confused by the wording. All right, folks, let me end it like I usually do. Stop share. There I am again. Hello. And uh, that's it for this week. And this is the fourth week. So after this, the following week will be the midterm. So. I will not add new material. Just give you questions from what we've read. That's what I'm doing. Okay, so to make it easy on you guys, I want to see a lot of A's. Okay, thank you. So then, shall see you soon. Bye bye.